you know, usually when, when I meet people, I tell them, you, you need to know two things about me. The first thing is that I'm an MIT scientist, and the second thing is that I'm Israeli. So, so what's, the, what's the connection? So in both places, you don't take no for an answer. <laughs> so I think that's something of the, of the spirit. Okay, lovely. So I'm going to talk about three things today. I'm going to present major problems that the world is actually thinking about hard. Okay, so three major problems. Then I'm going to talk about a small solution. How small? Teeny, tiny, small. And then we're going to talk about the Israeli connection to this whole story. Okay, so remember three things. Okay. We'll start with the prog problems. The first problem is, uh, let's call it climate change. And I'm not going to, I'm sure you're all aware of it, greenhouse gases, mainly CO2, accumulating in the atmosphere as a result of human activities, uh, mainly burning fuels. Which fuel? Mainly burning coal. Why do we burn coal? Because we want to make electricity. So producing electricity involves major coal burning, and coal burning uh, releases a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere, and that's why actually <coughs> Al Gore chose uh, to the cover of his book and the cover of his movie a picture of a power plant. These are the bad guys, okay? And uh, although China and India and the United States are sitting on huge piles of coal, and guess what they're going to burn to produce energy? Coal. We do have some kind of degree of freedom because we can make electricity with other things, right? We can make electricity by using what? Solar? and wind, and natural gas, right? So there's some degree of flexibility in our, in our thinking about making electricity and dealing with this problem, but it is a major, major problem. Problem number two is something we don't have fle 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 uh, flexibility, okay? And this is our addiction to oil, okay? So let's call problem number two um, energy security. Basically, energy security, mainly in transportation fuels, okay, DELIC, reflects the gap between the countries who are using most of the fuel and the countries who have the, the underground petroleum. It's not the same countries. And guess what? Israel is not high on the list of favorites of the guys who have the oil. So I have a friend, his name is Gal Luft, and he, he said we have to make uh, oil into salt. And well, what's the connection? Because one, salt was a strategic asset. This was the only way to preserve uh, food. So if you have armies you want to send them or you want to preserve food for the winter, you have to use salt. So the expression salt of the earth, salary in English, the word salary is coming from the word salt because Roman soldiers were paid in salt. So salt was a strategic asset. And what happened later? Technology came. So we have refrigeration, we have uh, preservatives, and all of a sudden salt is nice, but it's not a strategic asset. So Galuf says we have to do the same thing with petroleum we have to use technology in order to make it non-strategic because it is a strategic weapon. Okay? So, how am I doing so far on the problems? Delivering, right? They're a big problem. Okay, the third pro uh, problem, let's call it food security. And this is, has to do with feeding the world. There was an article in Time magazine not long ago, The End of the Line, in which they described the horrific situation of fish in the oceans. Okay, the fish population is collapsing because of two main reasons. A, pollution, and B, over-harvesting. Now, why do we over-harvest the fish? Because half of the fish in the world are grown by men in artificial ponds. So you have to feed the fish with fish. So you actually harvest fish to feed the fish that you grow. And why can't you just feed fish with soy or corn, right? We'll know in a minute, okay? But remember, these are three major issues that humankind is dealing with. And I will just mention one attempt uh, to create biofuels, which means alternative fuels. The United States, for instance, chose corn to produce ethanol to replace gasoline, which technically it works, and corn grows very fast. But there's a little bit of a problem, because you're using resources that are needed to grow food crops, using fertile land, using fresh water, so you're going to drive your green car and someone's going to starve? Not a great idea. Okay? So remember the difficulties and the challenges that the world is facing. So I think I delivered so far on the three problems, right? More or less. Okay. So now, let's talk about why, what's the connection between the three problems? And this will lead us to the solution. Okay? 
What is CO2? CO2 is mainly carbon, right, with an oxygen molecule. So CO2 is mainly a carbon problem. What's fuel? Fuel is carbon. It's another carbon problem. And what is food? Mainly carbon. Okay? So we have a schizophrenic approach here. On one hand, we're shouting, too much carbon, right? Too much carbon goes to the atmosphere as CO2. Too much carbon is killing us. On the other hand, we're shouting, not enough carbon. We don't have enough carbon as fuel and not enough carbon as food. So what's the difference between the first kind of carbon and the second kind of carbon? The first kind of, uh, kind of carbon is gas. CO2, so the carbon is in the gas form. The two other forms, it's organic carbon, fuel, and you know us mainly. We're, we are products of carbon. So if you think about it, the world has a carbon problem, right? Someone needs to take the CO2 in a gas form and convert it into CO2 in an organic form. There's a natural process that does it. You know what's the name? It's called photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is what all plants do. They eat CO2 and create organic material from it. And now I want to introduce you to the world champion in photosynthesis, which are, ah, by the way, just to talk about fish pollution, it's a former subject. This is a, a picture I like, it's from National Geographic. They took a fish, they analyzed the fish by the amount of drugs the fish has. So if you have a headache, don't take Tylenol. Eat the fish, the Tylenol is already in the fish. Okay? <laughs> Prozac, everything uh, you can, yeah. Anti-birth, I mean, whatever. Anyway, maybe Efrat should recommend they're not eating fish. Okay, um, so, so these are the world champions in photosynthesis. These are microalgae. And what I would like to do in the next two minutes is tell you the amazing story about microalgae. It all started with an eight-year-old boy who met me in Boston and says, are you a scientist? I say, I, I, I hope so, I'm trying to be. I say, listen, I, I don't sleep, I, I'm really worried. I don't sleep at night. Why? Because I learned that the plants are producing oxygen. They're making photosynthesis. And they're producing the oxygen we all breathe. And in Boston, in the winter time, the trees have no leaves. So will we be able to breathe in the winter? <laughs> wow, it's a good question. So I looked into it. And the boy was half correct because the major source of oxygen in this specific room, the oxygen all of you is breathing now, is coming from microalgaes in the oceans. Okay, it's not the rainforests. The rainforest in Brazil is half of the story. The second half is microalgae. <coughs> now, in, in English, it's easier to explain it because petroleum is oil, right? We call the petroleum we find in the ground oil. You know oil of what? So I met this uh, CEO of uh, PetroChina, it's a huge uh, Chinese company, and there's an interpreter because it doesn't speak English. And I said, you're a major company. Yeah, we're a $500 billion company. I said, great, so could you tell me where is petroleum coming from? He said, uh, from, from the ground, fossil, fossil. I said, yes, from the ground, but what was it? Before it was an oil, what was it? So he's asking me, dinosaurs? I said, no, I don't think we, try, we drive wrecks around. Uh, it's mostly algaes. So the interpreter is saying, really? I said, you just have to interpret. You're not a part of this conversation. <laughs> okay? So the point I'm trying to make, what we call oil, is mostly algae oil. We drive algae oil every day. Every airplane is taking off using algae oil. Okay? So we breathe an algae product. We drive an algae product. And remember the fish? And I told you, that there is, there's a reason why you need to feed fish with fish and not feed fish with corn, corn or, or soybean. Or, and the reason is omega-3, okay? There's only one group of plants that produce the DHA and EPA omega-3s that we all use for our brain, for our heart, and fish need it for the same reason, brain development and, and cardiovascular situation. And omega-3s, are being produced only by algaes. Okay? We do take fish oil pills because fish accumulate them by eating algaes. Okay? But remember what else is accumulated in the, in the fish. Remember the next, former slide, right? So um, I, I was talking to a company once that um, they clean the fish oil. So I said, yeah, we know that fish oil is full of mercury and chemistry and whatever, but we clean it so it's good. I said, yeah, it's the same thing as like, I'm going to hand you a cup of water and say, listen, this water used to be um, sewage. 
but I claimed it. I really go for it. Try. So it's not a great proposition. So, 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 algae are major in our life. But the most important thing about algae, algae do not need fresh water. They do not need fertile land. They can use brackish water and no man's land. So you can create a platform that does, does not compete with agriculture by any way. Okay. So what do you need in order to create this platform? And that's a story of Israel, in my humble opinion. Okay. You want to create a system that would take the CO2 coming from emi CO2 emitters, and you want to feed it to algae. For them, it's gourmet food. They're happy to get CO2. They eat it. Half of their body is carbon coming from CO2. <coughs> and then it's an amazing platform to create the three products all together. It's not this or this or that. It's this and this and that. So you, create, you can create biofuel from the oil of the algae. Not a big secret because we all know we're using biofuel, we're using algae based fuels already. You can get the omega 3 from the source, not secondhand. And you can get the protein meal because remember, for every ton of meat, you need four tons of protein feed to feed the animal. Where are you getting this from? Okay? So I think that's a direct touch to the major problems we talked about before. Now, why Israel? Because in order to create this platform, you need to master a, a basket of, of, of technologies. First of all, you need to be able to recycle water. And Israel is a world champion in water recycle. Israel, Israel recycles more than 72% of the water, number one in the world. Number two, Spain, 12%. Okay? So water recycle is an amazing tool. We have this tool. Okay? The second thing is plant biology. Israel is a world leader in adapting plants and plant engineering to, uh, to thrive in harsh conditions. I remember once in Boston, we were in Whole Foods, and my kids took this beautiful pepper. And I had, they had a little sticker, Arava. So I told them, guys, I know where it's coming from. It's coming from the desert. And they said, no, Dad, it's you. You always exaggerate. And then we visited the Arava, and I took them to the, to the place they grow the peppers. And I couldn't believe the sweet pepper is coming from salty uh, water and middle of nowhere. So yes. And of course, all the water usage technology, drip irrigation, and, and, and desert agriculture, this is a, so a place of excellence of Israel. So applying these tools to algae actually do exist in Israel. I'll give you some example. This is a Japanese plant in Eilat, NBT, growing algae mainly for the Japanese market. Another one, a symbiotic in Ashkelon, taking flue gas from a power plant to create algae. Um, another one, Kibbutz Ktura in the Arava, also creating algae for nutraceuticals. And this is a new project. You can hardly see it because the picture was taken at night. But this is in Kibbutz Dan in the north of Israel. Um, and that's an Israeli technology that got a $100 million check from the Obama administration to demonstrate this technology at a 1,000 megawatt power plant in Arizona. How do I know it? Because I got the check. Okay? <laughs> okay? So, you now what's the vision here? The vision here is that CO2 will be looked at not as a problem, but as a feedstock for a viable field, which is growing algae that, again, do not need fresh water, do not need fertile land and can produce things that the world is really looking for. Again, should be demonstrated in Israel and then applied in China, in the United States, in Australia, etc. Okay, so I think Israel could be really a catalyst for this change. And I'll add another dimension. And remember, we mentioned Al Gore uh, and his um, global warming um, platform in the beginning of the talk. So I want to end in the same in the same place. Uh, Al Gore won a Nobel Prize. Nobel Prize for what, do you know? Nobel Prize for environment? No. For biology? No. For peace. And you ask yourself, wait a minute, what's the connection between global warming and peace? The connection is we all need to work at it together. It's going to kill us all the same way. OK? So I can tell you that uh, working on the, on the problem is of interest to all. We're working with one of the major airline com uh, companies from the Gulf areas. I have only one passport, Israeli passport. Okay? I enter this country back and forth, and I have a stamp of that country on my passport. And guess why I'm welcome there? Not because I like my accent in English. It's because it's, tr it's dealing with a problem that they have, and they're looking for a solution. So for that, they look the other way when I come. So I think 
I think it's a beautiful uh, platform to make a change. I think Israel has a place. And uh, you're all invited to the project in the north uh, to actually touch, feel, and taste the algae.